Mark Spangler, Aaron Oaks, both uh, U.S. Army veterans, both Apache pilots, and and both continuing to serve. So we're both missionaries with Wycliffe Bible Translators, and our goal is to help the Bibleist people in the world have access to the scriptures. I, I wanted to do something different, and I didn't know what it was. And I had some uh, test pilots encouraging me to put in a, 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 a flight packet, and I'm like, that's not for me. That's for smart. I didn't even know where pilots came from. You know? I, mean, I thought they were pilots in the, in the real world, and then they sign up the army, like, oh, you can fly. Here you go. I didn't know they made them from scrap. I didn't know they made them from, from dirt bags like me. I'm like, you're ready to go to a strange place and, and, and do, do yeah. cool things. And she's like, absolutely. You know, and then, wow. you know, they ask the kids, you know, who wants to go to a strange place and do strange things? They're all like, yay. You know, so it was, it was a no brainer. And, and what, I've, what I've learned is, is um, it wasn't about answering the call. It was more about just being obedient to what God has given us and, and how to use it. Thank you both for taking the time. Um, uh, this is the first time we've actually had people coming on live with us, which is great. But really, it'd be interesting. Uh, you guys flew in from Cameroon, right? So, I mean, how long have you been uh, in the States right now? Just a couple of weeks? or uh, I've been one week. Uh, I'm still there. Uh, but more yeah, there. I came back in June with my family. Uh, our oldest daughter graduated high school, so we're taking a small break. So I've been here... For a few months, um, I'll be here till January. So you're not on camera in time still? No, I'm on Arizona time. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then just to introduce you, this, uh, it's Mark Spangler, Aaron Oaks, both uh, U.S. Army veterans, both pilots, Apache. So H64. 64, that's right. Sorry. I got the, the UH60 stuck in my head all the time because that's what I was stuck with. But um, both Apache pilots and, and both continuing to serve, obviously, uh, in a different um, aspect than, than you have in the past. But it'd be kind of cool to hear t just about your mission. What are you what are you guys doing right now? Who are you working for? Um, what what takes your what's what you what does your day look like, you know, in Cameroon? But uh, if you wouldn't mind just kind of it doesn't matter who just just jump in there and tell us what you do. Well, I'm still on my, my first year. So I'm, I'm still uh adjusting my brackets of what normality is. And so I think Mark could speak better uh, specifically on, the, on what our organization does. So we're both missionaries with Wycliffe Bible Translators, and our goal is to help the Bibleist people in the world have access to the scriptures. And so in Cameroon, there's over 200 different languages, uh, close to 270. And so we're trying to get Bibles in all the different languages. Um, there's a hundred plus that have some scriptures available and there's still more that we're trying to help get the work done. And so we get to use our skills as helicopter pilots to move people around, uh, to get that work done faster and more efficiently. All the reasons we have aviation in the army is a force multiplier. If we're trying to apply that into missions and into Bible translation as well. And then the extra bonus is the aviation guys, we tend to be a bit more personable and we're kind of a PR piece yeah. for the organization. We have amazing, brilliant, talented translators and linguists, um, but they really love the language and they don't always like to talk to people. And we tend to like to talk to people and uh, can barely speak French, even though we try. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, that's kind of where we get to use all of our strengths between aviation and meeting and talking with people and, and uh, just trying to love on them the best we can. See, I, when I hear your, you hear about your mission, I was thinking like, well, these guys are loading Bibles in their helicopters and flying them and dropping them, but it's part of it. Actually. Uh, but it sounds also like you're moving the people who could speak those languages around so they can translate the Bible. That's exactly it. We're, we're, uh, uh, an over glorified logistic solution. A lot of the places where, where um, this work is being done is places where it, the, the road infrastructure is insufficient or um, uh, um, non-existent yeah. in some cases. And, and uh, you know, 
the the transportation for, for somebody to get where, where they're they're operating to where they need where they're actually functioning in, in, in the language capacity um, can can often be perilous uh, if they if they take uh, what transportation is available that's not aviation so you're looking at a several hour bus ride um, overnight and then to where the bus buses stop or or train there's there's a nice north south train that goes but it only goes halfway through the country and stops. And then you, it's moto taxi, um, which is not the safest mode of transportation. Yeah. Uh, it's bush taxi, which is, uh, and you're talking six or seven people piling up into a Toyota Corolla um, that don't know each other and, and filled with bags and, and the trunk is open with all kinds of things because it's, it's the means to, to get across the country that, that is locally available. And so uh, by the time somebody actually gets to where they're going several days later, they need two days to recover because it's, it's, a, it's an aggressive trip. And whereas, whereas we can get them there in an afternoon and uh, and they're ready to work as soon as they get off the ground. And so it's it, it I don't know it, it, the, the, there's a, a gap in price obviously that right. the, the but but the, that cost in, in my opinion and often in the translator's opinion is is uncomparable because the the quality of work and the, and the availability to do work when you get there as opposed to um, uh, a traditional way of getting yeah it. sucking on a tuk tuk <laughs> <laughs> the exactly. jingle truck as you're going. Over mountains, yeah, I can yeah. imagine that's I've done that before, and, and it's not and, fun. And, and there's there's checkpoints, and and it all depends on the demeanor of the people who are there, and then uh, yeah, it's it 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 could be interesting. It always is. Mm -hmm. it, it always is. Yeah, if I and I haven't done a lot of this stuff with different mission organizations in the past, one of the things we teach them is that I mean, the most common thing we focus on is transportation between point A and point B being the highest risk activity that you can take on when you're you're in a developing nation where there's not good infrastructure so yeah flying is definitely a, a better option I, I i agree with that what we do with this platform is i mean we find people who are doing the work you guys are obviously still serving you, you serve in the military i think both both from afghanistan and um uh to take that even further for the kingdom it's kind of the same place where my heart is right now too it's like okay I, i've tried this way you know, to, to help people. And a lot of people don't look at the military as trying to help. Most of us go into it. It's like, we want to do, do something to help people. And we see things a little different on the battlefield too, I think. But even after this last, I don't know, Afghanistan kind of, I'm sure you guys are, <laughs> we, we don't want to go down that road. I don't think Chad, <laughs> it's kind of like we, but anyway, after seeing that, it's like, God, what is the most effective way that I can, have a, 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 a wide um, effect, you know, on the world. And it wasn't in the, in the military. That was, I think, part of my training to get to this. I keep telling my wife, my wife was telling me the same thing. She's like, don't you feel like you've done your stuff? You know, you've had enough adventure and everything. I said, I don't feel like I've done anything. I think I've, I feel like I've been trained to get to a certain point. So I don't know if you guys feel the same way or not, but um, what, what made you decide to do this? I mean, did somebody come recruit you or was it God just saying, Hey, this is, this is something you need to do? You want to go first? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, I, I grew up in a Christian home, so I've always been here to missionaries and all that stuff. And after high school, I want to be in ministry of some kind. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I thought youth ministry was going to be cool because coming right out of high school, that seemed like the most fun job. Uh, but I had a mission trip in college that I served my team and got to serve people. And I'd heard a little bit about mission aviation and what they do. And I was like, that sounds like a serve job. And I like to serve people. So that, that might be what I want to do. And I was uh, hanging around a girl that um, eventually became my wife. And that was where her heart was. I was like, where's this girl? Yeah. <laughs> Well, she turned me down a couple times, so I had to wear her down, but eventually we got married. Um, so it, it had always been in the back of my mind, but I was already in the guard, and eventually I was like, oh, now if I want to be a pilot, I can be a pilot in the guard. That'll help me get to where I want to go as well. And uh, so that's it started early on, but it took 10 years from when I felt God was saying, you're going to be a, a missionary pilot, to when I finally got on with Wycliffe, and I was sitting in their orientation. So it wasn't like an overnight, you just sign the thing and you go and do it. It, it took some time and some preparation. Um, but all along the way, learning about it, 
and even after the military, like you're saying, it's like, I love serving. I love being the guy, the big brother that they called and when they're in a bad way to show up and make their life easier. And that's kind of what we're doing now is, I mean, it's a long slog getting a Bible into somebody's language. Some of these projects have been going 10, 15, 20 years. So we come alongside these translators all along the way, helping their kids, you know, bringing them groceries, bringing them snack, like fun stuff that they don't normally get in their villages or just the ease and the support of, and just easing their stress. Yeah. Especially there's one woman I flew last year. Um, she would, she dreads the trip for like two weeks until she found out for sure we were going by helicopter and she's just like, ah, now she could relax and prepare for the next step. And so kind of being that support for them and even a counselor out as we're flying, they, they like to talk. They yeah. like to hear everything that they're going through. So being able to, to share life and do life with them has just been a real encouragement. So that's, that's kind of how it went for me. Um, a little bit of patience and, and perseverance. Is your family um, with you? Yeah. So I've got my wife and, and our five kids. We live in the capital of Yande in Cameroon. And so that's that's the plus over the military is it's it's a family thing. Um, and just being able to share the struggles and the joys also with our family and with our kids and hopefully leading them in a way that that they still want to be a part of what we're doing. And they're they're seeing what God's doing in our lives and everybody's lives around us. Yeah, I keep thinking keep thinking, man, I wish I could take my sons just so they get a taste of what it's like somewhere else and then see first off what they have, but also what true service is really about. So I think it's, it's actually a good thing when you get to have your family with you mm -hmm. for sure. What about you? No, what you said. Same thing. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I also have a servant's heart and that's probably the key to it all. But, um, I, I stumble into things, uh, usually by accident or reluctantly. And, um, uh, I ended up in the service, uh, I signed up in 97 and, uh, and then September 11th happened, you know, and, and so it's, it's th things change. Cause I was, I was just a reservist. I was just having, you know, having my fun on the weekends and, and, and guard bombing. And then, you know, I, I ended up doing two back to back to deployments, 2002, 2003. Um, nowhere in my scope of my MOS either on the second one. It was, it was a peculiar thing. It was just, anyway, it, it, it was interesting. So um, I, I wanted to do something different, and I didn't know what it was. And I had some uh, test pilots encouraging me to put in a, 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 a flight packet. And I'm like, that's not for me. That's for smart. I didn't even know where pilots came from in the Army. I thought they were pilots in the, in the real world. And then they sign up the Army and like, oh, you can fly. Here you go. I didn't know they made them from scratch. I didn't know they made them from, from dirt bags like me. I'm like, you know, okay, I'll, I'll submit your packet, but this isn't what this, you know, I figured I'd fail the test. I figured I'd fail the physical. I figured something. And uh, each gate, I just kept hitting reluctantly because I, I had other plans. I wanted to go do other things, um, but uh, I, I'm reluctantly obedient to where the Lord puts me. So I, I just wait for me to prove him wrong. <laughs> and, then, and that never happened. And so uh, I ended up getting accepted into the flight program and somehow made it through flight school. Um, you know, the whole time giving it a hundred percent, but never just thinking I'm, I'm this is, you know, thank you for caveating that. Yeah. I'm like Mr. Helicopter pilot. Yeah. Ah, I made it through. Yeah. <laughs> We're okay. I, was yeah. Gonna go. I made it through and expected to No, I, I expected to at some point the, the, the system to catch me and to, yeah. and to pull me back. I'm, I've been in the same boat. And, uh, and it never happened. And, and so just, just like you said, the, the Lord was preparing and training you for, for everything. I had no idea what that was. And, uh, uh, you know, for the first couple of years of flying, it, I was terrible. Um, uh, the people around me knew I was terrible. <laughs> they were wondering how I even made it through. Um, but then something flipped, and, and I started loving it, and I started enjoying it. And, and uh, it became, um, as a slow learner, you also uh, retain things as, as you grasp them. And so then at some point, all the hard work that I was putting in uh, came into play, and, and I was able to um, be on the other end of my peer group. And so I actually ended up being pretty good at what I did. And so I ended up being a, a test pilot and an instructor pilot. And uh, um, so, some of my leadership was reluctant whenever it was time for me to leave. But uh, um, somewhere along the line, I, I met Mark in 2010 about, and uh, I, I had called JARS once, you know, because I was like struggling with like, what do I do with this flight thing? And I called them uh, like in 2005 or six. And they're like, yeah, kid, call back when you have experience. Because it was right after I got out of high school. And I was like, how picky can you be? 
your, your pilots fly for free. Right? <laughs> Apparently, pretty picky because yeah. they, they they, it's actually a pretty pretty aggressive um, uh, 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 acceptance program because mm -hmm. you have to apply. It's like a ten day flight interview, and they just sit there with a clipboard quietly and they're like, "Do this maneuver, and do this maneuver," and it's all things that the whole time you think you're you know you're failing, you know. And uh, but anyway, um, but yeah, so I did that in 2017. I did that, that flight interview. I got accepted into it. Um, after we met Mark, I'm sorry. So, so I called Jars. They said no way, and, and so that was off the radar, off the table. Never thought about it again. And so we met this guy and his family, and uh, they were on their way out to, to to do these things. And I was like, oh, yeah, this was a thing that that I was interested in that the Lord put on my heart. And uh, and so we got to follow them through their adventures. Um, with, interestingly enough, with a, with a community that that um, had embraced him, also embraced me. So a lot of the same friends, a lot of the same families, different times. And so it was. It was kind of kind of neat to to, to ride his coattails through through that adventure, and then I show up at Jars and get to ride his coattails some more, um, and uh, and now I get the, the the blessing to work with him and, and, and to work alongside him and learn uh, from him. And we call that sparring. Sparring. Yeah. Well, iron sharpens iron thing. It's like everybody thinks of sharpening it's on a whetstone or something like that. It's like I always say, no. He's talking about his men. Being there for each other to, to help push each other. Like, we need that. We can't yeah. do things in a bubble. Like, I got so isolated once. I just, I thought I was perfect. I thought everything was perfect in my life, you know? And then something happened, you know, it's like, you're not in control of crap. And you definitely need those people to help motivate you. Uh, Shad's one of them. You know, Shad's helped me out throughout the years quite a bit. Um, I, I, yeah, I can certainly say thank you for your service, Jen, and, and be sincere. Um, but I also want to thank you for your service to the kingdom and, and that's, you know, equally, or maybe even more important. Um, so it, a lot of what we're doing now in the shift here at iron edge is, uh, you know, we want to highlight and inspire heroes of faith. You guys actually check every single box on our, on our list, just so you know, that's right. And so I, I hear your humility and I really appreciate that. It's very honorable. Um, but like, seriously, a hundred percent, you guys check and our, you know, we, our bar is pretty low. We say, as long as they make three of them, we'll have them on. <laughs> so, uh, um, but you know, the cool thing about all this and what God's doing is it's all relational and that's how the kingdom of God works. And so, you know, big shout out to Judd, who was our very first guy on our podcast. And, you know, that's how the kingdom works, the the family that we all are. And so I'm I'm excited about that part of, of this conversation as well. Um, you know, Pete, Pete's little lead in there. Yeah, I mean, I've been in the spiritual foxholes. That's that's about it. I really respect what you guys do. But um, the fact that God, God called you to do something and that you responded is a big part of being a hero of faith. Uh, you know, a lot of us as... Just everyday guys, uh, we try to disqualify ourselves, and um, you know we're really not qualified. But that's like the whole point of giving your life over to Jesus, right? That's the whole point. He qualifies you, and so uh, then when you answer that call, he equips you. So uh, you know, I I want to hear more about about that in your lives and that portion because it's easy to just kind of talk about it and go, oh yeah, these guys. They're doing some cool stuff and you certainly are. Um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about how, you know, answering the call and, um, you know, the action of faith along with what you're well, doing. Yeah. Is it tough? No, <laughs> not, not, at all. Um, not at all. For, for me, I mean, I, I try to do what my wife tells me to do. And, and it's been on her heart for, for years and years and years to be a missionary. And she didn't know what that would look like or when that would even happen. And so we, we have five kids and she spent, uh, and we, we had the first child 11 months after. But you we both were, have five kids? Yes. Yeah. Not the same kids though. <laughs> Just to clarify. Okay. Thank both. you. That's a, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so, um, our first child was born like 11 months after we were married. So we never got to have, like, we never, we never got to build a husband wife relationship. We went straight into parenthood and, no, uh, and that was right at flight school too. So I, I, I married helicopters before, you know, right after I married her. And so I don't lose, uh, um, I, you know, there's, there's, I, I wish I'd go back and, and, and readjust my priorities. Uh, but you know, so she's been a mother for the last 16 years and that's, you know, and, and 
we, I guess we made this decision uh, three years ago. And so what that looked like. And so when an opportunity for, for, you know, like was, you know, you, you ready to go to a strange place and, and, and do, do yeah. cool things. And she's like, absolutely. You know, and then, wow. you know, like ask the kids, you know, who wants to go to a strange place and do strange things. They're like, yeah, you know, so <laughs> it was, it was a no brainer. And, and what I've, what I've learned is, is, um, it wasn't about answering the call. It was more about just being obedient to what God has given us and, and how to use it. And, and it's w- whenever you align your ac- activities and decision with, with exactly with, with obedience uh, to, to the Lord, then, then it's, it, it makes things easy. And, and um, it, it, I don't like making choices. I, I make too many, I, I'm forced to make too many of them throughout a day. And so when it comes time to, it's just easier to just be obedient and say, yeah. you know, what do you have for me? And, and, and then I don't have to make the choice. I just have to walk the path. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I love that. I love that clarification and it makes a lot of sense. Um, it, you make it sound a lot easier. <laughs> than, <laughs> yeah. Well, somebody give me so, come on. Cause I, I'm, I'm feeling like, man, what's going on with my walk? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never, just obey. Come on. Just obey. It's that I easy. I thought I was. You know, every single time I find myself in a, a pit, <laughs> I, I keep thinking, I thought I was following the right path. But uh, Mark, did you have a similar, similar or is it? Yeah, I think it's, it's very similar to what Aaron said. And the other common factor that I'm hearing what he's saying, um, you know, thankfully God brought alongside the right wives for us because yeah. our wives are supporting. And especially in my case, like she was even more, interested in missions than I was, she kind of brought me along. And then through our, our companionship and God was calling us both. And so we're, we're a team. And there's been so many times where we've supported one another and she's kind of helped prop me up, um, in our, in our faith. And she, she says, I'm the one who's, who has more faith than she, she's kind of more wants to see everything lined out. And it's like, look, this time we have to, we have to take this step by faith. Um, so that's kind of what I help provide for her and as a leader and she, but then when I'm starting to doubt, she's still there. It's like, well, this is where God has us. So she's been my support. And so, I mean, that's, that's really important as well as you get into these things and just in life, as we're trying to be obedient, um, maintaining that relationship and that friendship and, and supporting one another is important for all this as well. No, I mean, it's important. We talk about that here. Uh, I'm on my second marriage. God had a plan. I actually never would have met my wife that I'm with now if I hadn't gotten divorced. God had a plan in there too. It's like, okay, I just got to adjust fire for you, I guess. But um, if I had, didn't have the wife that I have now, um, if I'd never met her, I don't know. None of this would be happening, I don't think. Um, it's important to have that that team. And I'll say that to anybody any day. Yeah, Paul was like, hey, yeah, okay, it's a KB, you know, single, whatever. That's, that's his, his personal opinion, which is great. Some people are meant for that, but I'll tell you, it's so much easier when you have somebody working with you, you know, and you're carrying each other's loads. It's not a misogynistic thing or whatever that the world puts out. It's a partnership. I mean, Shad probably, he can attest to that too, as well with his, with his wife. You know, it's like, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, yeah, we're, we're all plugging our wives right here. We have to. You can't just let that go. Man. My wife watches. It. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, for me, I I probably wouldn't be involved in Iron Edge if it wasn't for my wife. So the partnership, I love how you talk about being a team. It's not one above the other. It's like we're, you know, we're equals in this. We're, we're in this together. It's God's design. It's God's plan. Uh, and Pete and I have been talking offline about a lot of this stuff, actually, uh, in, in the book we're reading, it's been around for, for a bit, Wild at Heart. Um, so uh, one of the things that I I think I, that I want to point out that God's doing right now, and, you know, we're, we're here trying to inspire other men, right? And so if you're looking for your manhood, if you're looking for um, affirmation in your partner, it's actually not going to work out. But if you find it in God and your 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 wife, is allowing you to be the man that that God created you to be. It, it's it's going to blow your mind how it all works, yeah. and so that that's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm seeing, and that's that's the example that we want to follow. Is is the biblical one, right? And it, it's not it's not check boxes, and it's not you know us being 
oh, look at us, you know, we're, we're, you know, pumping our wives up, but it's actually, it's actually the right way. And we're still, we're still learning it as we go here. And it's uh, the re reality checks sometimes, you know, but yeah, we certainly are blessed to have women that are going hard after God and that we can too. So and luckily he's the one who's guiding us. Cause I was super shallow. I told my wife, I said, I married you because you're hot. <laughs> this is a good thing. Good thing. I got everything else that came along with that too. I mean, our journey has been together, you know, it's like, we, neither of us were perfect when we met, neither of us were following Christ when we met, but so that's not like a disclaimer. It's like, you, or something that's going to derail you from being able to follow God's, God's plan for your life. We both had to start listening and we both changed. Yes, that's possible too. It's not like he brings you together and everything's perfect. And they all, you know, you guys probably know this too. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it was for you. I don't know. But not for me. It's been a journey together, but we both are listening to what God's saying and changing as we go along, which everybody should be doing. If we're not changing, then something's probably not right, you know, uh, and listening more and more. And that's how it's it's been, you know, been, been a blessing. So I don't want everybody who's listening to us to think that we married our wives and then everything was like, oh, <laughs> it's so, it's so great. It's so perfect. I don't know. You guys, you guys have perfect marriages, right? We're getting closer. Yes, yes. We're, yes. we're a lot closer yes. than we were 20 years ago, but yes. it's been a long slog. Um, yeah. Probably a lot harder for my wife most of the time than for me. Um, but yeah. yeah. And then, well, I mean, in the mission field, so I've had to counsel missionaries a lot. Um, <laughs> I had to do marriage counseling because we have all these scenarios. You start that, drinking till I became a missionary. Yes. <laughs> Just let me tell you that. I've heard I'll that. summarize that. <laughs> But I mean, I've worked with a lot of couples that are out in the field, you know, and or, as they say in the world, on the field, okay? You're on the field, you're not in the field. In the field is no. But uh, I've worked with these people and I've run, we run through scenarios, stress inoculation scenario. Yeah. And uh, it's a lot of couples. And so we have a couple that are, uh, scenarios called the divorce scenarios for a reason because it really forces people to make decisions in under duress and things like that that they're not used to, especially if they're just going in. And then we have to do marriage counseling afterwards. But we've had a couple, quite a few. It's, it is not easy to happen because you are typically in a foreign country or in a developing nation where it, it's not an easy life at all for anybody. If your partner doesn't happen to be on board fully or understand fully, you're going to have some hard times. But it sounds like you guys, you kind of went into this, like this is what God wants us to do. So what's daily life for you guys like over there? I mean, is it? How, how are you living? How is it, how, how do the, does a family live? You know I mean? If you don't mind getting into that a little no, bit. Uh, it's different now. Um, I, Mark used to live in the Northwest, which is a little bit more of the village life and I'll let him speak for himself. But when we went for language training, um, France wouldn't let us in because of COVID. So in order to go learn French, we actually got permission to come into Cameroon, but we had to isolate ourselves from the rest of the expat community because uh, you're not going to learn if you can sneak off and, and play games and, speak English with it. Uh, so we, we were isolated and, and uh, immersed effectively in order to learn French. And um, I, I'm a slow learner. Uh, I got a good six months. We're, we were supposed to get about 18, uh, but circumstances changed to where uh, my uh, skill set out prioritized my language learning for the moment. Uh, I'll be able to re-enter language training later, but I'm functional now, like, like a three-year-old functional. Um, but for, but that life was way different than what we're living now, uh, day to day. So we, we would go buy um, meat uh, out in the market under an umbrella with, you know, never been refrigerated, got butchered that morning, you know, and, and uh, oh boy. we would go buy um, fruit in the market, you know, uh, and and vegetables, um, you know, is, is about a, almost a mile walk, I guess. So we got to, we, we walked a lot more. We didn't have a vehicle. Um, and uh, we interacted with people. Uh, church was a very different experience, um, uh, and, and it was interesting. There's a lot of miscommunication there, anyway. <laughs> um, because you think you understand a circumstance, and then and then it turns out you don't, and and then you sign up for obligations or whatnot. Again. But my my kids were in the choir, so um, that's that was their immersion. Well, my my oldest too, so they're singing and dancing in this in this African choir. That, that it, it's it's pretty cool. Um, and uh, they, they enjoyed that. Uh, but when we moved to the, the city and started functioning as, as a pilot, it's, it's very different because we have access to things like grocery stores. 
Um, the last 10 years, uh, things have changed in, in Cameroon and Yaoundé particularly so much like uh, um, because there's Western grocery stores moving in uh, that, that are European based. Um, so you have access to things that you might not have had before. And uh, so it's, it's, but with the big city comes other things too. Um, you, escalated security, you know, uh, razor wire, walls, things that we didn't have kind of in, in the village life, so to speak. And so um, with all the conveniences comes the, comes, you know, crime, uh, comes, uh, you know, opportunists, comes traffic, comes all these things that you didn't have to worry about um, elsewhere. And so right now, day to day is, is, a weird mixture of, of what you would expect in a big city, but also with some cultural aspects that are completely, I don't, I don't even think I could explain them because they're so out of context that, you know, it's just you, your brackets of normality slide over and certain things that never would have been acceptable are acceptable and expected. And I think it could be shock. I mean, I, I've spent months at a time, maybe in foreign countries and that are fully, you know, developed Western European, whatever. And even that, yeah. It's still kind of a, you know, I mean, you got to get used to it. But, um, I mean, it sounds like you guys are, are kind of, how long do you plan on doing what you're doing, you think? Until I'm called somewhere else where the country asked me to leave or the organization asked me to leave. That's good. But, um, so, so to answer your question, day to day right now, because we, the kids are able to go to a private school and things like that. So we, we were prepared to homeschool the whole time because we thought we'd be living where they're living, where there's, there's not really opportunity for that. So we brought curriculum for the next 12 years. But right now our day to day sounds just like what you would do here. I, I, I get up, I help get the kids ready for school. Uh, I, I, I do a small workout and then I drive to work and then at work, you know, we do whatever is necessary, you know, it, it, either, either paperwork or, or work maintenance on aircraft, prepping for a flight, doing a flight, coming back, doing what you need to. Maybe there's some external communication meetings that you need to do with, with other organizations, other people drive home, kids home, come home from school. We have dinner, uh, it's life. It, it's it's life. It's not, not, it doesn't sound too much different yeah. than the service. Yeah. Uh, prior yeah. To this. With the occasional, you know, uh, blackout or with the occasional, like we don't have water for a couple of days or, you know, the occasional random things that, that are day to day life that, that eventually you just acclimate to. Um, it's no different than what you do here now. And, that, and, and I don't know what that looks like uh, being uh, operational as a pilot in the other context because I haven't had the opportunity to live the, the village life and, and fly at the same time. So, uh, I do want to put a caveat on what Aaron's saying because he is making it sound pretty mundane. But I mean, a lot of times we like to say, if you've got five things on your to-do list for a day and you get one of them done, that is still That's a success. Yeah. That is a yeah. success for the day because yeah. even the drive to work is not. I mean, it's it's, it's only four kilometers, I think, from where we stay. Is it five? Three. Five kilometers from the house to the hangar. Uh, that can take anywhere from 15 minutes to 45 minutes, depending on the day and traffic and what's happening. Yeah. Um, so you just, you don't know, <laughs> and it does get normal. And sometimes it's a, it's fun to figure it all out, uh, to see how many people you can make mad or cut off or whatever along the way. Cause that's normal. That's kind of expected. Um, Opportunity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's kind of like our own game getting to work, but then uh, on the wrong day, you know, that, that 15, becoming an hour and a half drive home is enough to make you want to like yeah. <laughs> pull out and like, we're done. See you later. So it's, it's just all of that. Um, and village life in a lot of ways was even more interesting as far as what you were going to see day to day. Uh, cause sometimes you spent most of your morning. Yeah. Why don't we have water now? I got to go figure out the water. Why don't we have power? I got to get figure out the water. Or why is this person coming to my house with this issue today? Um, so it was just more of that. So in a much smaller context, but that's where the fun was too, because you were going and meeting with people and talking to administrators in one place or being able to walk right into like the mayor's office. If you had a question for him or walk into somebody else's office, um, all to try to improve our situation and to try to share and build those relationships and things like that. So it, uh, it was a unique experience and right. Take a little getting used to quite a bit, yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. It sounds like, I mean, you guys are both very like Chad was saying, humble and obviously you had a, a direction that you're, you knew you wanted to go in starting out. I mean, even before the military, both of you, right. Um, along the way, 
I, I know personally, I've had so many walls just get thrown up, you know, and, and try and block me. And it would be so much easier sometimes just to say, hey, you know, I'm going to go this path because it's a lot norm, more normal, easier. You know, I don't have to take any risks. And But it sounds like you guys kind of just knew. What do you think? Was there some influences there, you think, from your, your family life or, or the way you grew up? Yeah, we're going to start talking about that. Sorry. Because <laughs> I think that has a lot to do with our our path, you know, our family. My dad is a really, really good man, and and he he sacrificed a lot, and really did a lot of things for the people within the community. And it's uh, often things that I haven't seen until I was older. And uh, he was he was an administrator in school, and um, and and uh, he dealt with a lot of uh, parents and got to see things that you don't want to see as a kid, like uh, um, neglect, uh, abuse, and 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 had to deal with that on on a on a regular basis and how to handle it from that administrative perspective within the realms of legality. And that's a very difficult thing to traverse, but just his servant's heart. I have no doubt that I adopted that. And, um, and, uh, and they've, they've been nothing but supportive in every bad decision I made. And, uh, and you know, um, they, it was a difficult thing for them. I know for a fact, um, to, to see their, their grandbabies, um, go across the world. But yeah. Um, they they also served in a teaching capacity uh, in in Zambia whenever we were very little. My, I, I had one brother; he was five or six, and I was you know about four. And and uh, and so they know that they don't have any they don't have any grounds to complain about it because they did the same thing as their folks. Um, but yeah. you set the example. You, yeah. <laughs> you got to be careful to do that. Yeah. By you, Mark. Yeah. Um, again, if you don't mind. I'm. No, I, I'm just thankful. Kind of, I got a lot of general generational guidance in being following who Christ was, um, and so for my dad, also very servant-hearted, and he, you know, would mow the mow the lawn at our church, tiny little church in Phoenix, for every week for years, and I'd help him and stuff. Yeah, we actually had grass. Um, <laughs> But he was just happy being just serving. And so, but they allowed me the freedom to, to do a little bit more. And so, again, with aviation and missions, it just felt like I just get to serve. Yeah. Um, and that's, and just youth group was a big deal. We went on a short term missions trip in, in high school. So God used that to, to kind of start guiding me. Another short term trip in college kind of guided me just more of this pull myself out of my comfort zone, trying some new things, seeing how God is leading. And, uh, and then we got into Wycliffe and it's what's been shocking to me is like, it's all these little steps. It, it still hasn't been, all right, I've arrived anywhere. Now my faith is strong. It's, <laughs> it's like, there's this next step. Um, and for us just checking our faith, like when we graduated orientation, with our organization, they're like, all right, you are cleared to go fly in Cameroon. That exact same day, Cameroon said, you may want to consider not coming anymore. It's like, <laughs> what? Yeah. We've been waiting two years to get to this point. Like we had tickets, we were going. And they're like, we don't know what the future looks like. And you may want to consider not coming. This was 10 years ago. So then we start praying we start asking lots of questions, start talking to people. And nobody had the answer. Nobody knew what things were going to be like in the future. Um, it came down to us, like where where are we going to put our trust and our faith? And we still just prayer, and there isn't like anything magical. It just you had to make that choice. And depending on who you're talking to, you could have justified not going. That would have been easy on paper, but we still felt like we wanted to try we wanted to, to trust and we wanted to see how God blessed that and used that. And it's happened four or five more times in the last 10 years where we hit the same exact spot. Like, is it time to pull out? Is it time to move forward? We don't know. The, the irony of that is, is 10 years later, he's having the exact same conversation <laughs> with me. He's in camera and going, you may want to not, you know, you may want to consider not coming. And it's like, no, the Lord's called us. And yep. like, All right. So, I think it's it almost yet another trial, another gateway to say, you know, you're going to be operating on faith regularly. You're going to, you, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
there's a big gas tank, but right now it's on fumes and, uh, you know, you, you can jump on or it'd be the easy answer is like, you know, go, go operate with, in a country and with an organization that is, uh, that is hopping and popping. I think everybody should expect to have those situations. So you, you guys have been more and that's what you're in. I mean, I always tell people, it's like, you, you can't expect that nothing's going to come along to try and stop you from doing a mission because you're taking the fight to the enemy and he knows it. Mm -hmm. So he's going to look for whatever way he can to discourage you uh, at the most opportune moment, you know, to where you're either at your lowest or you're having doubts or whatever. He's going to jump in there and just like, don't he's, do it. It's he's not really working. good at hitting the exact insecurities that you have to exactly. or the insecurities of those around you. And, and it's like any time that, that your insecurities are being pinged, it's like, all right, either I'm about to be effective or maybe I'm being effective right now. We think we were talking about this. It's like, even with what we're doing right now with Iron Edge, we talked about it last night. I said we need to have plans in place for when the enemy starts to hassle us. Because he'll do stuff like trying to divide us, you know, or put little thoughts. And I, and I always can tell it's like, okay, that's the flesh. Mm -hmm. and he's attacking the flesh because he knows what the flesh is. But I either listen to that or I listen to, you know, the spirit, you know, what God's saying. But we have to have plans in place and have strategy in place. It's my intel side of things. Doing the predictive analysis, right? Like, what what's he gonna what's he gonna come at me with today? Okay, I gotta expect that, so I should keep my eye out for it. And I don't always see everything. Of course, I'm not like a guru, you know, or some kind of. I don't have a crystal ball, but it's like that is gonna happen no matter what. And all our guys, if you're if you're going a direction, uh, just expect that that's gonna happen. That he's gonna try and stop you somehow, and it could definitely be something subtle. And if you're not looking, if you're not paying attention. And he'll he'll go get you off into isolation again, where you can just be passive, you know, and not doing anything, you know, comfortable. That's usually the thing that I've found with me. It's like this is going to take away from your comfort level. Don't do it. God wants you to have life life more abundantly, you know, or something like that. Yeah, I uh, I I really appreciate this conversation. I feel like we could uh, just record all day, like just do a like let's just keep chatting, right? Um, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of things too before we progress too far. Um, you know, going back to the influence that your dad's had on you. Um, you know, a lot of times we make it some grand thing, and you know, everything in our culture right now is gets so blown up, and you know, uh, just the celebrity. Everything becomes celebrity, right? Um, but what I what I heard you guys saying is your dad's just made a choice to serve, and that affected your life and now look at what you're doing because of the you know their choice so a lot of that was just the example uh, i can say that my dad was the exact same like uh, we like to say when my wife and i talked about that he essentially he changed our family legacy by cho by choosing christ um, i have a great family all of them you know the ones that aren't you know aren't believers or aren't walking with with christ but um, there's something different about what my dad did when he chose Christ. And, and really, I think it's, he, it was, he's outside of himself. It's not self-focused anymore. It's focused on Christ. And so therefore I am, and hopefully my kids continue that legacy. Um, you know, they're certainly introduced to him and it's their choice. Um, but if I can just be the example of laying down my life and they see that and they, they choose to follow him too, then I, I think I did maybe something right. So I'm hearing that in your guys' story, and and I want to highlight that for our men to see. Like, it's not always some big grand thing. It's just making the choice to serve. Um, and then one other thing you talked about that I just wanted to ask a quick question um, was, you know, you said you said uh, if we get one thing done out of five, then that's success. And actually, my question is, what does success look like for you guys? Um, the, like the organization you're with and the, the mission that you're on, uh, how do you, how do you measure that? And, you know, ultimately, and um, Pete, I don't know how much further we're going, but like, I want to know, I want to make sure our guys know how to support you and how they can get alongside and all that stuff too. But if you could answer that success question for me, that, that'd be awesome. Can I, can I start? Yeah. Okay. The end state is, is truly uh, biblical. And it is uh, every tribe, every tongue, every nation has received and heard the word. And uh, and our goal is in their own mother tongue. 
And in the meantime, if we can serve in, in between through uh, medical support or through, uh, you know, trauma healing or any, any other capacity, we're just uh, incidental um, uh, blessing. Uh, then that's also a victory. But true in-state is every tongue, every tribe, every nation. Beautiful. That's really the, and for aviation, I mean, naturally we've got, we have two machines. We have a fixed wing airplane in our department. We have the helicopter that we're trying to use. So if they're just sitting around, they're costing you a lot of money and not getting any benefit. Um, so they need to fly to, to make it worthwhile. And so right now there's a bit of a struggle in using it. So we want to get our usage up because when we're using it, that's where the PR piece comes in. We're either helping save lives medically or we're, mm -hmm. um, moving these translators around or helping these other workshops. So there's the element of we need our hours higher. And so our hours have been kind of low the past couple of years as we're just facing a lot of these debates. Um, we've historically, we were expats, Westerners coming in, using these tools, advancing things. Thankfully, we've moved to a, a more localized national work workforce. So we've got national translators, national workers that want to move around, uh, national leaders in our organization, but they're not used to spending, you know, two months of their salary on an hour flight in the helicopter. Right. That doesn't make any sense. So, but we value them and we want to care for them the same way we would the expats. So we want to serve them. We just have to figure out how we can pay for it is what our organization is struggling with the most. Um, so we can keep moving everything forward because they're doing, they're doing amazing things. We will put you guys in our resources page along with a link of directly to this specific mission that you guys are doing. So if anybody wants to, they can uh, definitely help you guys out. And uh, if their heart is, is called to do that. Um, so we'll put that in there. We'll, we talk about success of that organization. Just real quick. If you could give out anything to our, to our, our listeners to Iron Edge to motivate men who are thinking about stepping into some, some kind of service, what, what would you say to them? Pray about it first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Make sure it's not the flesh uh, telling you to do something. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think just obedience and submitting, uh, uh, Jesus, give Jesus the wheel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. no, I think same deal. And just pray about it and just, just try. And, you know, maybe, maybe kind of go through, cause there've been times, um, like even when I, when I moved over to missions, I had 11 years in the guard, I was being offered, you know, I was ready for a promotion up to a new rank. I was being offered more jobs that would have helped my career and helped where I am now, but it would have waited. It would have, we had to choose missions or, or military. And for the guys that want to get there 20, this isn't a knock on you. But for me at that time, I had to choose a faith step or, you know, or the, the safe, the safe thing. And I felt like if I stayed in another 10 years, I would have had 10 more years of excuses not to, to become a missionary. And so that, that was the kind of that first faith goal. So if you're kind of tr debating some decisions like, man, I'd really like to do this, but if it can wait two more years, I'd be, it'd be safer. Well, where, who's, who are you trusting in that instance, you know, and start trying those little things. All right, God, I'm going to, I'm going to trust you. This doesn't make a ton of sense right now, but let's see where you show up in these, in these things and just looking and, and cause it's not God just all of a sudden showing up. It's, it's you allowing him to show up. Um, and that's what we have to start doing. And again, in missions, that's, that's what keeps me coming back. Because on certain flights, it's like, God, I don't know how I'm going to get from here to there today because everything looks junk. And then all of a sudden, I've got a tunnel in that time period for me to get from X, X to Y and then eventually back to Z that didn't make any sense until I started taking those steps forward. And it just kind of keeps happening over and over and over. So, Amen on that. That's yeah. a great metaphor. If, if I could add on that, one more thing I, I, I think I'd strongly recommend is, is a spiritual mentor, somebody with wisdom and oversight that can speak into your life and say, no, you're being a bonehead or, or this, you know, and, and somebody that can pray with you as well. Um, yeah. And then, and then like you, you touched on it and Pete, you touched on it as well. Uh, there's always indicators. 
that you're on the right path. And for me, it was, it was the world calling me back. Like, just like you mm -hmm. had opportunity for promotion, opportunity to be better, like not only be better, but this will help you in your missionary life. And, and it's like, as soon as I made this decision, not only were the dream jobs I had in mind available, they came calling. And then whenever I told them no, they came back with better deals. And, and, and they said, here's your dream and somebody else's. And, you know, and it's just like, I have to be on the right path because the world is calling me back hard. Yeah. And, and, and I am uh, sad, but at the same time, it's like emboldened because it's like, I, I'm, I'm making the right choice because the world wouldn't be doing this to me right now. Wow, that's huge. Uh, you remind me of something Neil Kennedy says that the Bible never tells us to take leaps of faith, but it tells us to take steps of faith. So if we just take those steps, um, then, you know, God will light our path. He'll lead us and direct us. So, you know, you don't just you don't just throw it all away and then go, oh, shoot, I made the wrong mistake. God will lead you. He's faithful. So I really, really appreciate how you guys just broke that down. And uh, yeah. I, th I think that what you just said, Aaron, will resonate with a lot of men as well. Like you make a choice for God and then all the shiny things start coming at you, you know, not necessarily God now. Right. So really appreciate that. <laughs> Guys, thanks for joining us today. Uh, as you can see, we're doing things a little different because uh, we're trying to hit those everyday heroes of faith. You know, uh, we think of all the guys in the Bible. And like they were something just magnificent and spectacular, but they were every, everyday dudes uh, that obeyed. <laughs> <laughs>